Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you because you're always present with us whenever we come together. In the fulfillment of your promise, that where two or three are gathered in your name, you'll be there in their midst. I will welcome you here tonight, Lord. I will welcome your spirit. And Lord Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord, we are present here before you. That you, the living word, will break up this bread of life and teach our hearts that we may know and that we may understand what is your will for us today. So that, Lord, the entrance of your word will bring light into us and the light will point to us the way we ought to go. And as we, by your spirit and grace, go in the right direction, your blessing will be upon your church, will be upon every family, and will be upon every individual. Lord, help us to see you in the world, hear you from the world, and then know what you demand of us today. And whatever it is that we're leading us to understand, Give us the grace that we may do, that we may obey, that we may practice this word coming from the mouth of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. At present, we are studying the book of Prophet Joel. Originally, the book was addressed to the people of Judah. And these people of Judah had been going through some problems in their nation. And the devastation, the destitution that came upon them had made them to begin to wonder. Because these were people serving the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. These were people in covenant relationship with the Lord. And these were people that had been victorious before over all enemy nations around them. And even the sound of their name alone reminded the people of that generation the great, great blessings the Lord had showered upon them. Looking at them, they were the symbol of the recipients of the majesty and the glory and the power and the blessings of the Lord. And when you mention Judah, or you mention Zion, those names sent shocks into the enemy camp because of the way the Lord had manifested himself in the midst of his people in the past. But now, these people who were the favorites of the Lord, these people that were the recipients of the blessings of the Lord, now... They found that there was no joy in their nation. No provision in their nation. And all the good, good things they had before, everything had vanished, evaporated away. And some enemy nations had come in their midst and removed all the good, good things they had. And as they were wondering, why will this happen to these people of God? The Lord sent Joel, a prophet, unto them. And he showed them the why. But not only the why, the how they could come out of the situation in which they found themselves. And this book of Joel shows the church. How the church as a whole can move up from the depths of spiritual decline to the very heights of a great revival the book is usually divided into two parts the first part giving us the account of judah's pitiful condition under divine wrath chastisement and judgment and then the second part containing the promise and the prophecy of divine favor the promise of pardon forgiveness the promise of blessing and the promise of the great outpouring of the Spirit and the promise that 
they will still be able to overcome their enemies. And even it even gives us the final establishment of the kingdom of God. But between the first part and the second part, between the problem and the promise will be a bridge of transition. That is, between the chastisement and the expected blessing, there will be a bridge of transition over which they can cross from where they were to where they wanted to be. And on that bridge of transition, there were some milestones that the Lord had given them, telling them, if you walk through this bridge, and you go through the first milestone, and the second, and the third, and the fourth, you'll get to the expected place. What are those milestones? Number one, genuine repentance. Number two, genuine prayer. Number three, genuine fasting. Number four, faith in God. You, you please must understand and note those words genuine repentance because Joel was there to tell them that the repentance the Lord wanted will be something that is really genuine because uh, there is unacceptable repentance a kind of thing that looks like repentance but in the reality of, of it it's not genuine and because it's not genuine, it's not acceptable. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the watch of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. Here you will see something that looks like repentance. Confession. I have sinned. The reason is I feared the people. And that's the reason for my doing what I did which has not pleased the Lord. But just pardon me. Overlook it. Turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said, I will not return with you. The favor of God is not with you, so the prophet of God will not be with you. You see, that repentance was not acceptable because it was not genuine in verse 27. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and he tried as Samuel said, no, I will not go with you. He turned and he wanted to go away from Saul. And Saul was desperate. Don't go. He laid hold on his garment, that is, on the mantle of Samuel. And the mantle, his clothes, was torn. Verse 28. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord has reigned the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and has given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Here you will see that even though he was pleading and even though he was begging and he even confessed I have sinned. The sin was not forgiven because the repentance was not genuine. What Joel was calling the people of Judah to was genuine repentance. I told you number two is genuine prayer. 
because there is prayer that is not genuine prayer that is not acceptable in the sight of the lord in proverbs chapter one proverbs one verse 24 because i have called and he refused i have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof then it tells them in verse 28 then shall they call upon me but i will not answer they shall seek me early but they shall not find me for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the lord my brothers and sisters it is not just prayer it is genuine acceptable biblical prayer when we reject the word of the lord and then we go into praying and praying and praying joel tells us with all the parts of the bible that that's not the kind of prayer that the lord is calling us to in proverbs chapter 28 verse 9 proverbs 28 verse 9 he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law even his prayer shall be everybody tell me abomination when we refuse uh, the teaching of the word of god and we do not follow the word of god prayer becomes useless worthless meaningless on this bridge of transition going from the chastisement to the blessing i told you on that bridge there are four milestones number one genuine repentance number two genuine prayer number three joel calls them to fasting genuine scriptural fasting but we need to understand there is also unacceptable fasting fasting that we do and god doesn't answer the prayer in isaiah chapter 58 isaiah chapter 58 verse 3 wherefore have we fasted say they and thou seest not wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge behold in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and exert all your labors hey, they were wondering what else does he want us to do we have repented it's not acceptable we have prayed answer did not come and we joined fasting to our prayer and repentance and thou takest no knowledge what else are we going to do what's the matter it's because in the day of your fasting you still take pleasure in what you want to do rather than what god wants you to do and you exert all your labors you lay bodies on other people you steal oppress other people in verse 4 behold ye fast for strife and debate although these people were fasting there was fighting strife debate argument and it says to smite with the feast of wickedness ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high is it such a fast that i have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes upon him wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the lord 
Is it not this the first that I have chosen to lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, that she break every yoke? Look up here, brothers and sisters. The prophet was telling the children of Israel, it is children of Israel, they are people that they tied down. They had people that they were oppressing. And they had problems in their own lives. And they wanted their own problems to be solved. And the problems they caused for other people, tying them down, oppressing them, putting yokes on them, they let those people tied. And then they were fasting to solve their problems. And the Lord said, it doesn't work that way. If you want your fasting to be acceptable, lose the oppressed. The people you tied down and the people you're oppressing, set them free. Let them go so that you are not having any, bo any burden on anybody to undo the heavy burdens. Let the oppressed go free and that you break the yoke you put upon them. In verse 7, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thine house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? And they were hiding themselves from their husbands and from their wives. And they had some secret, secret things they kept to themselves that their, their flesh, the other part of their flesh, did not know about. And they were fasting. And the Lord said, go and obey my word. The revelation of the word, and then your fasting will be acceptable. Verse 9, then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am, if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, and the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity. He said, if you stop the false accusation, and you stop speaking vanity, then your fasting will be acceptable. Now, also, number four, in the milestone, on this bridge of transition, is genuine faith but uh, we also need to say as there is unacceptable repentance unanswerable prayer unacceptable fasting there is unrecognized faith a kind of faith that people think they manifest and god doesn't recognize that faith in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Here, James was telling the people of God that faith without corresponding action, let me say it in a way you'll understand. Faith in God without faithfulness to God will not work. If our faith is going to work, there will be faithfulness to the God we are manifesting that faith in. That's why it says, what does it profit my brethren? Though a man say he has faith. And as not works, corresponding action, faithfulness, can faith without faithfulness save him? In verse 17, even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 19, thou believest that there is one God that doest well. But please remember, the devils also believe and tremble. Verse 20, but wilt thou know, O vain man, 
that faith without works is dead in verse 26 for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also please come back to joel now joel was calling the people and he said although the conditions are gloomy although there is devastation and the destitution in the land yet there is a way out if there is genuine repentance and prayer and fasting and faith in god in joel chapter 1 from verse 14 joel 1 verse 14 sanctify ye a fast call a solemn assembly gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the lord your god and cry unto the lord alas for the day for the day of the lord is at hand and as a destruction from the almighty shall it come is not the meat cut off before our eyes ye joy and gladness from the house of our god the seed is rotting under their clothes the garners are laid desolate the banners are broken down for the corn is withered how do the beasts groan the herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture yea the flocks of sheep are made desolate O lord to thee will i cry for the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness and the flame has burnt all the trees of the field the beasts of the field cry also unto thee for the rivers of waters are dried up and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness it has a situation but there is hope and in that passage i've read to you you'll see three things clearly number one the proclamation of declared fasting proclamation of declared fasting number two the perplexity during a devastating famine the perplexity during a devastating famine number three praying for divine favor number one is this call to fasting in verse 14 look at it again sanctify ye a fast call a solemn assembly gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the lord your god and cry unto the lord to fast means that you abstain from food you deny the appetites so as to give yourself and the entire time unto prayer and if you're a student of the bible you will know that fasting is not anything strange moses fasted joshua fasted david fasted elijah fasted nehemiah and daniel at their own time they also fasted when you come on to the new testament you'll find that jesus christ our lord and savior he fasted and from the sermon on the mount you will remember that the lord jesus christ expects us to fast because he said when ye fast not if ye fast which means then it's expected there will be times in your life and in our lives all together that fasting will be required and paul the apostle he even started his own christian life by praying and fasting after he had met the lord on the way to damascus and then he got to damascus for three days and three nights he ate nothing he drank nothing he was just seeking the face of the lord waiting upon the lord praying and fasting 
And when God called Ananias and pointed him to where Paul, Saul of Tarsus was, the comment of God to Ananias is, Behold, he prays. And then uh, you will find that other people too fasted in Bible days. As you look at this uh, passage I read to you in Joel chapter 1, verse 14. Number 1, there is preparation for fasting. Verse 14, sanctify ye a fast. Set apart, set time apart to seek the Lord and to seek his favor as a preparation. Number 2, the proclamation of a solemn assembly. Call a solemn assembly, not a frivolous assembly. There are people that fast, and as they gather together in their fasting, it's not a solemn assembly, it's a frivolous assembly. And no wonder, many of those people, they fast, fast, fast for days. During the time of their fasting, they'll be jesting, they'll be joking. Uh, there will be some things, the pleasures of the flesh. Uh, they might even watch their television. Or they might see things and go places uh, that uh, will not really befit the sobriety, the solemnity that ought to be associated with their seeking the Lord. Proclaim then a solemn assembly. Number three, it tells us the people expected to join in the fasting gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land as the ministers and the members were all concerned for the decline spiritual decline and for the physical destitution and the social desolation and they were concerned for all the things happening around them not only the ministers, the members, and all the inhabitants of the land. They were to join in the fasting. Number four, the place of meeting for the fasting. Gather them into the house of the Lord your God. That we come into the house of God. And with all solemnity, with all seriousness, giving the honor that is due unto God, giving it to him we come on that day of fasting number five the prayer that is to be the main activity during that day of fasting cry unto the lord solemn earnest agonizing prayer calling on the lord to change the condition of judah and to change the condition of his people today in Joel chapter 1, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of our closet and let the priests the ministers of the lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say spare thy people O lord and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them wherefore should they say among the people where is your god you will see there that as the people were gathered together in those days, they didn't even spare, excuse anyone because of the age, the old and the young, the high and the lowly. They were to bring everybody together and they were to fast. And they were even taught how they were praying. Today, when you see that there is a problem in your personal life, and you have done every other thing and it appears that this problem is going to stop your onward journey uh, the ladder of success the lord wants you to climb spiritually and also in a physical material way 
everything is just coming from every direction uh, to bring you down from the ladder you are climbing and you've done everything you've seen friends and you've uh, seen the people that are able to help and with all the promises they make nothing comes out then you realize as an individual this is the time to wait upon the lord they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they'll mount up with wings as eagles you'll be able to climb to the place where you ought to be it may be there is problem in the family and as much as you love one another in your family you don't understand things just come to want to scatter the family the husband is doing his best the wife is doing her best the children are trying the best they can yet it appears there are problems not solved and it appears discouragement devastation destitution poverty failure everybody touches everybody in the family that's a time when that family will come together and they say this will not go out except by praying and fasting it may happen to a group of people a group of people having the same concern it may be that you have the same concern in your place of work in that firm in that company all of you there you are uh, many of you there you are christians and those of you who are christians in that place of work you just see that everything is going down everything is going down everything is going down and they brought uh, people experts consultants from outside to come and look into that firm and they taught you the latest modern approach to be able to conflict resolution conflict management and production everything they taught you and then you try to apply all those things they taught you instead of the thing coming up is still going down and then those of you who are christians there you have this same concern we are walking here and see what is happening and we are christians if the consultants and the experts although the ideas they gave us are very good if it doesn't solve the problem there is a god in heaven who loves us who knows we are here and who has promised us good things we go to him in prayer and fasting but sometimes it's a local church and that local church is having different kinds of problems and that church cannot tell why these problems are there we have repented genuinely the problems are not solved we have prayed unto the lord and the problems still linger and we manifest all the faith we can manifest and we quote all the promises we can quote and the problems are adamant and stubborn and they remain there that will be a time for that local church to set time apart and sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly and call the elders and all the members of the church inhabitants of the land together and cry mightily unto the lord so that is promised for us as a people of god the israel of god the judah the church of god will be fulfilled in second chronicles second chronicles chapter 20 in second chronicles chapter 20 verse 3 and jehoshaphat feared there was a great problem and set himself to seek the lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all judah and judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the lord even out of all the cities of judah they came to seek the lord and then they fasted and they prayed it was in the midst of that fasting and praying the lord looked down and he sent a message to them and said that battle is no more theirs it's for the lord god will solve your problem 
as we wait upon the lord you are waiting individually you are waiting collectively the lord will answer the burden of your heart and wipe all your tears away in nehemiah chapter 9 nehemiah chapter 9 from verse 1 now in the 24th day of this month the children of israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them as you look at the fastings in the bible it's not just that they did without food they did without the usual clothing they did without uh, the, the modern pleasures they did without even some things that were legitimate because for them the fasting was to be solemn and they put on sack clothes and even put dust ashes on their heads and the seed of israel separated themselves from all strangers oh they said we know that the lord doesn't want us to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers and in the time of their fasting so that the lord will answer them they separated themselves from all strangers and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers and they stood up in their places and read in the book of the law of the lord their god one fourth part of the day that means if you take the day as 12 hours 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening it means that one fourth of the day three hours they were just listening to the word of god it was a sober moment for them and they heard the word of god without being in a hurry and that's what we're saying that in the time of fasting in the time of waiting upon the lord in the time when there are peculiar problems and we need solution we will come before the lord and listen to the word of the lord and if there has been any shortcoming any weakness human weakness in our lives before the weakness of not being patient in the presence of the lord during that time we are waiting on the lord for the problems to be solved we will not drag the same old problems we used to have into the time of our fasting we'll wait upon the lord and hear the reading the interpretation the application of the word of the lord as long as the lord is still speaking to us and another false part they confessed and worshipped the lord their god and they spent three hours just hearing the word and the next three hours after that they were still praying and their problems were important to them to be solved and therefore they said no other thing is as important as solving the problem because of that they waited patiently in the sight of the lord in esther chapter 4 esther chapter 4 verse 3 there's a threat here that the children of israel the jews were to be exterminated destroyed and the people knew not just for them but for the generations to come not just for the generations to come the messiah that was to come through the jews if haman succeeded in destroying all the jews how about the promised messiah that will come through the lineage of the jews they knew this was a serious thing it was a present problem that had a future consequence you see there are sometimes there are some problems that are present today and if those problems were not solved the problems had future consequences that's what these people realized that's why they took the problem serious 
and they waited on the lord esther chapter 4 verse 3 and in every province whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came there was great mourning among the jews and fasting 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 and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes and in verse 16 even esther herself said go gather together all the jews that are present in shushan and fast ye for me i neither eat nor drink three days night or day i also and my maidens will fast likewise and so will i go in unto the king which is not according to the law and if i perish everybody i perish self denial went along with the fasting not counting time or life as anything but knowing the solution to this problem is more important than any other thing because of that esther said i'll fast my maidens will fast and you go and fast for me too and if this thing costs my life in the attempt to save the jews because of the future consequence it will not matter my life is expendable so that i give it up for the salvation and the rescue of the people of god and so they fasted and they prayed and they didn't perish but the solution came to their problem and as the solution came here we are rejoicing today that christ eventually was born and christ died for us as our savior because those people prayed and fasted and the jews were preserved looking at joel chapter one the next section the verses in chapter one tell us about the perplexity during a devastating famine come back to joel chapter one verse 15 joel chapter one verse 15 alas for the day for the day of the lord is at hand and as a destruction from the almighty shall it come is not the meat cut off before our eyes ye joy and gladness from the house of our god joel was trying to tell trying to show the obvious everybody knew it was obvious to them and he said which of you have or has enough meat at home and as you come to the house of the lord isn't joy and gladness cut off from the house of the lord that the joy of the lord which is our strength he was saying you people of judah do you see that as we used to see it's not the meat cut off as we're here before our eyes and even joy and gladness taken away from the house of our god the seed is rotting under their clothes and as our farmers go to harvest they pull up the crop and instead of having something to bring back home everything is rotting under the clothes the garners are laid desolate the bands are broken down for the corn is withered how do the beasts groan even the animals in the forest they cannot even see any remnant of the crops to eat 
everything is gone. And it says the herds of cattle, they are perplexed. Because they have no pasture. And ye, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. This is the perplexity that they found in a devastating famine. And as you bring it to your own personal lives, and you remember your first days in the kingdom, the joy, the gladness, the happiness in the Lord. You open the scriptures like this, the first verse you looked at spoke to your heart and gave you solution to the problems that you are looking to solve. You sang and it was enriching. And you witnessed and people gave their lives to the Lord. You came to church and it was joy. You had the message of the word of God and it just pointed to the right thing and you said thank you jesus thank you jesus that's the solution i'm looking for and the members of the choir come to sing and as they sang it was like angels singing and it ministered to your heart and for the rest of the week as you are going the chorus is coming up in your heart you are just joyful and sorrow and sadness vanished away and he gave you the oil of, of gladness. And it was like you were riding on the wings of an eagle flying through the air. In days gone by. But today as an individual, you look at your life. You look at your quiet time. You look at the prayer time. You look at church fellowship time. And you look at when you get to the house fellowship. And everything is dry. And the joy that ought to be there. And the joy that was always there. And the goodness of the Lord you always saw. And the good dreams you ought to have. Singing in the dream. Going in the rapture in the dream. Your enemies lying down prostrating before you in the dream. Those good, good dreams have gone. And as you look at the devastation and the destitution, you say, Lord, there's a problem here. Or you look at your family, and as a family, you see that the joy that was there before, the togetherness, the harmony, the unity that was there before, you just find, although there is no quarrel, although there is no fighting, the depth of joy, and fellowship and pleasure just just eating together and just seeing one another just the smile on the face of your spouse your partner it was enough to make the day for you but now everything is gone and you look at your church your local church your leader that was like an angel of the Lord to you. And the other members that were just beautiful pillars in the house of the Lord. And all the people that you used to fellowship with. Eh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You were such in a hurry. Sunday morning running to the church going to the church and if there was no breakfast if anything was delaying you children hurry up look at the time we're going to be late and then your wife and the husband and the children maybe you didn't have any vehicle just cram yourself into the vehicle then you came over here and by the time you got over there on that side we have not even started and the people of God just came in and they were praying and then you began to run a relay race and as you came in there and an usher said sit down here you respected that usher as if it's an angel from heaven you sat down sank into your seat and then we come 
and then uh, the pastor comes and says praise the lord and that praise the lord just was sweet in your ear you looked up like this you smiled you say we're in church again we are gathered together again and then the congregational singing and the bible reading and the offering time and the choir singing how beautiful it was and then we ended the service you say what have we ended like that are we not to, are we not going to continue and then the joy of the lord just beamed on your faces and then you went back home that was church time how is it now the joy the gladness the pleasure the, the fellowship in the house of the lord with one another it's gone that's what Joel was telling them, and they knew. He was telling them what was obvious. And he said, are we not all perplexed? Because of these devastating famine in Amos. Chapter 4. Amos. Chapter 4. From verse 6. Amos 4, 6. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. Uh, the meaning of that is there was no food to eat and therefore their teeth were clean. Even if they didn't brush, there was nothing to brush off from their teeth. I've also given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and they want the lack of bread in all your places yet ye have not returned unto me says the lord the lord said i permitted that farming expecting that when you see that problem you will return i am surprised that even though there is farming yet ye have not returned unto me in verse 7 also i have withholding the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest and i caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city one piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon it rained not withered so two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water but they were not satisfied yet have ye not returned unto me says the lord i give you the first punishment expecting that will turn you around and make you to return to me you did not then he said as the reason why i followed on with the second chastisement expecting now you will return and it says yet you have not returned then in verse 9 i have smitten you with blasting and mildew your when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased the palmer worm devout them yet have ye not returned unto me says the lord the lord was asking them don't you feel the punishment is the chastisement not painful unto you why i give you the first punishment you didn't return and the second you didn't return and the third and yet now you have not returned in verse 9 verse 10 now i have sent among you pestilence after the manner of egypt your young men have i slain with the sword and i'm taking away your horses i have made the stink of your camps to come up onto your nostrils yet have ye not returned unto me says the lord the lord was telling them don't you see these things are becoming more serious 
don't you see the problems are escalating and it is not an enemy doing it it is i the lord your god and the reason i'm doing it is because you are far away and i want to draw you to myself but i'm surprised the first stage the second stage the third stage the fourth stage of chastisement came yet have ye not returned unto me and then in verse 11 i have overthrown some of you as god overthrew sodom and gomorrah and ye were as a fire branch plucked out of the burning yet have ye not returned unto me says the lord you see the situation of those people you will think they will call upon the lord immediately because of the increase the escalating of the burden the problem the difficulties the devastation coming upon them and the lord had this controversy with them that as the chastisement and the indignation and the judgment and the wrath of god just kept on piling on them yet you have not returned unto me and the lord had warned them many many years before now that's what exactly he will do in leviticus chapter 26 leviticus chapter 26 i'm reading there from verse 14 leviticus 26 verse 14 but if ye will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments and if ye shall despise my statutes or if your soul abhor hate reject my judgments so that ye will not do all my commandments but that ye break my covenant i also will do this unto you i will even appoint over you terror consumption and the burning egg that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and ye shall sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it you see the warning he had given them now in verse 18 and if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me then i will punish you seven times more for your sins the lord warned them that if they remained adamant in their sin in their iniquity and the lord said he will multiply the wrath and the judgment upon them in verse 21 and if he were contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me i will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins you see what the lord said from verse 14 to verse 16 he said you know this is what will happen if you repent after that fine but if you keep on walking contrary to me i'll multiply those burdens chastisement and wrath seven times more and if that will still not bring you back from the place of sin and iniquity verse 21 and multiply the chastisement seven times more again and then he told them in verse 23 verse 24 and if ye will not be reformed by me by these things but will walk contrary unto me then will i also walk 
contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And in verse 27, And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you in purity. I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Verse 40. If ye shall confess, if they shall confess their iniquity, and the iniquity of their fathers, or their trespasses, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I have also walked contrary unto them, and I brought into the land, I brought them into the land of their enemies. If then they are circumcised hearts, be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. And you see what God is waiting for? And as those people of Judah were perplexed, he said, let there be no perplexity. Just at this point now, turn around. If you turn around and you seek the face of the Lord and you confess your iniquity and your sins and you surrender unto the Lord, have thine own way, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Then he says, I remember my covenant with Jacob, with Isaac, and with Abraham, and I'll remember the land, and then he will lift, he will remove the chastisement that he placed upon them in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29. Verse 17, Jeremiah 29, verse 17, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send famine upon them, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. They're so evil. And I will persecute them. There's a lot of host talking. Or the sword, or the famine, and with the pestilence. I will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth. To be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations whither I have driven them, because they have not hearkened to my word, says the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them. But they would not hear, says the Lord. The Lord said he was sending those things to them because of their sins that they refuse to repent of. Lamentation. Chapter 5. Lamentation chapter 5. Verse 7. Our fathers have sinned. And are not. And we have borne their iniquities. Servants have ruled over us. There is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. We got our bread with the peril of our lives because of the search of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible farming. And then in verse 16, the crown is falling from our head warn to us that we have sinned for this 
our heart is faint. For these things our eyes are dim. And the Lord said in Amos chapter 8, it's not just the physical famine, the lack of natural physical food and nourishment only. That there are times he permits the farming of the watch of God because the people of God have sinned against him. They have rejected the spiritual nourishment food that is sent to them. Because of that, he allows spiritual famine. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. This is serious. If we lack physical food, the worst that can happen is that we die. But if we're children of God, if we die like Lazarus, we go to Abraham's bosom. So, the ordinary famine, although it is serious, this is more serious when the Lord withdraws his watch from us. And there is a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. In verse 12, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek, to look for the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. We counsel our parents never to punish their children by taking food away from them. And God is a more loving father. And he will not ordinarily take the bread of life from us. But it comes to the stage where the Lord sees that his word is no more precious in our sight. And it comes to the very last thing that anybody can do. And it sends a farming of the word of God unto the people. And they become so hungry now. They even want the word of the Lord. They say, Lord, give it to us now. We want it now. We're so hungry now. We want the word of God now. And they run from sea to sea. And they run from the north even to the east. And the Lord hides his word from them. That is serious. That's the perplexity that people come into in a devastating famine when they refuse to repent. But Joel told them there's a solution that brings us to point number three. Praying for divine favor. In Joel chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. Joel Chapter 1, verse 19. O Lord, to thee will I cry. For the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And the flame has burnt all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee. For the rivers of waters are dried up. And the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. If you look at this uh, book of Prophet Joel, you'll find the many words that he uses. He uses the word in chapter 1 verse 8, lament. In verse 13, guard up yourselves, lament. He uses the word mourn in verse 9. The meat offering and a drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. He uses the word howl. 
that's to cry out and to scream in chapter 1 verse 11 be ye ashamed O ye osman men how in verse 13 guard yourselves and lament ye please how ye ministers of the altar he uses the word cry verse 14 sanctify ye fast call a solemn assembly gather the elders of the and all the inhabitants of the land in the house of the lord your god cry unto the lord in verse 19 o lord to thee will i cry he uses the word groan verse 18 how do the beasts groan he uses the word weep chapter 2 verse 17 let the priests the ministers of the lord weep between the porch and the altar you will see the seriousness and the fervency that joel expected in this prophecy if the people of god are to recover everything that they have lost but i told you in the introduction he wants us to repent but there is unacceptable repentance he wants us to pray but there is unacceptable prayer he wants us to fast but there is unacceptable fasting he wants us to have faith but there is unrecognized faith now the children of israel as the prophet said cry 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 later there were some people that the crying became mechanical the heart was not there and they turned the house of the lord into a kind of crying 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 that was hypocritical and god became so disappointed how is it that these people toy with spiritual matter in malachi chapter 2 malachi chapter 2 verse 11 judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination is committed in israel and in jerusalem for judah has profaned the holiness of the lord which he loved and has married the daughter of a strange god the lord will cut off the man that doeth this the master and the scholar that is those who are teaching the children of israel to do these things contrary to the will of god the master and the scholar the ones listening to those masters to have hypocrisy in the house of the lord out of the tabernacles of jacob and him that offereth an offering unto the lord of hosts verse 13 this have ye done again this have you done above the bad things you did before this have ye done again covering the altar of the lord with tears with weeping and with crying out in so much that he regarded not the offering anymore or receiveth it with good will at your hand those people uh, when they heard the word of god cry howl weep wail mourn lament they turned it into play they turned it into toy are, are, are you not crying your own cry now cry now cry now and the worship of god and the solemnity that he wanted and the sorrow for sin and the remorse and the true repentance and the tears of real repentance that god wanted those things were not there it became a dramatized kind of weeping and god said see these people they have added another thing even to the iniquity they have added this again the weeping and the crying 
that are not sincere. And then he said he couldn't answer their prayer. But if we cry sincerely to the Lord and call upon the name of the Lord to have mercy upon us, he knows when the crying is genuine. He knows when the repentance is genuine in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. I'm reading to you from verse 7. Judges 6, 7. And it came to pass... When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the land of bondage. And then he began to remind them the good things he had done for them and how they were biting the fingers that fed them. Later they felt sorry. And the Lord changed and removed their problem, their oppression, and their captivity. In First Chronicles chapter 5. First Chronicles chapter 5. Verse 20. And they were helped against them. And the Agarites were delivered into their hand and all that were with them for they cried to God in the battle and he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him there was genuine repentance and as they called upon the Lord the Lord her king listened unto them and delivered them Second Chronicles Chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, o Lord our God, for we rest on thee. And in thy name we go against the multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against us. In verse 12, so the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa, before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. There is a solution to every problem. If we can depend upon the Lord, but the way to have relief from the disaster and the spiritual famine and the physical famine is by returning to the Lord our God. Where should we go with our cries except to him from whom judgment and rebuke had come? If we will make a supplication to the Almighty in total submission unto the Lord, there will still be a time of peace and a time of prosperity because he has promised that he will answer prayer and the promised blessings will then be ours because he had said if i shut up the heavens that there be no rain or if i command the locusts to devour the land or if i send pestilence among my people if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land here is a bridge that God has built between the chastisement and the promised land between the problems the devastation the sorrow the wrath of god and the promised blessing and he stretches a bridge across and he says very simple the steps are there repentance prayer
fasting, faith in God. Go on that bridge. Repent. Better days will still come for you. Rise up and let us pray.